Hey, young people. Uh, this will be the, one of the revolutionary uh, series on uh, air support. Hopefully, my damn computer didn't know. Uh, it's been locking. Oh, good, it did. It's been locking up. So I'm going to talk about air support here. Got to turn the thing around. Sorry. Um, how, how do you deal with air support, or how do you deal with a superior? Well, this question is obviously people with military and the ability and arms to take out aircraft are going to have a different way of dealing with aircraft. But since this is a revolutionary series, I'm more talking to people who would be fighting when they're not a trained army, who would be fighting in a guerrilla type style against an invading army, invading terrorists, uh, somebody took over a neighborhood, you get caught in a riot, uh, the government goes rogue and starts trying to you know, lock up people on trains. Rick, they would never do that. The government doesn't do that. Okay. Uh, so, let's talk about air support for where you don't have good stuff. And I meant to grab my damn uh, camera over there, or my uh, drawing board. Uh, let's see. What is air, air uh, what, what's the purpose of an air attack? And the purpose can be fear, intel, breaking comm lines, weakening forces, taking out command and control, harassment, Bombing runs, strategic targets, or delivering personnel, or somehow providing or, or using a mission. Uh, air support is one of those things. I'm going to keep talking as I go get this thing. Air support is one of those things that a, a superior force is going to use that against you, and you need to be able to understand how to deal with it. Even though you don't have it, even though you can't use it, another force is going to have it, and they are going to use it. So if you don't know how to defeat it or how to work within it, and here's a little quick tip. If you got a whiteboard and you're worried about how to clean it, man, I use this orange stuff. You know, you get it at Walmart or whatever. It's right here. You put a little of this on your hand, and you rub it on that chalkboard, and then you wipe it off with a paper towel. Man, it cleans this chalkboard up like it's brand new. You can tell I cleaned all this right here. It got off because after a while, these little, because I forget to erase it, and then it shows up up here. So, the reason why I need this board on the air support is I really want to show you how to concentrate fire at one point. When an airplane comes by, I know everybody's going to crack on my drawing. Uh, so, when an airplane, he's going this way too, that's not a propeller, that's the tail section. That's the best place to be. I've been on a lot of plane crashes in the Air Force on scene where the planes have crashed, everybody died. Let me tell you, tail section's always intact. Wherever I find a plane that's crashed, intact. Go Google plane crashes. You're always going to see the tail section sitting somewhere. Don't ask me why, I think it's because this compresses and everything else. I don't know, the wind's picking up, but... Tail section is a good place to be in a plane. I don't like flying, so I know that. Believe me. Any problems, I'm heading to the restroom. So, <laughs> probably for more than one reason. So, if a plane's flying this way, and you have troops over here, and it's coming for a bombing run, or strafing run, whatever you want to call it, most people would think, I'm going to shoot at the, at the plane as it comes. Well, the odds of you hitting it, because you don't know the height, the angle, your lower, etc. The odds of hitting a plane with one shot as it's coming by is slim to none and slim left town. You're just not going to do it. You've got to really lead, and again, you're not going to know how fast the plane is. It's going to look like it's coming fast. As it gets closer, it's going to look like it's coming faster. Um, as it's going away, you might have a better chance because you know. But, you know, to take down a plane, you want to either take out the engine or the pilot. You need to take out some sort of mechanics. That's why helicopters a little bit easier to take down a plane. So the plane's coming this way. Instead of all these people here shooting one shot, what they teach in the military is you pick a point where the aircraft is going to go through, and everybody fires at that point. And now when a plane flies through this area, the odds of that plane hitting a bullet, or they call it the magic BB in the Vietnam War because they take down planes with one BB and get propeller, chew up, and it doesn't take much to mess up a plane, fire a shotgun at a helicopter that's flying low, and you get one of those BBs into the uh, spinning parts, and you're going to do damage. 
It may not take it down now. It's going to mess up their ability to control it. And it's going to take it down. They're going to have to fix it. It's going to remove it from ability to do operations against you, which is ju almost just as good as taking it down. Take it down, you get to take a couple enemy with you. Uh, so in helicopters, the most critical part is obviously the pilot, the tail rotor, or this mechanism here. So if I'm shooting at a helicopter, I'm going, if I can hit the pilot, put my little skid there, little wheels, whatever. All right, so here, here, here's the, the helicopter. If you shoot this rotary, if you shoot the rotor, rotary here, probably not going to do a whole bunch. If you can get this mechanism in this area, the engine part, sometimes on the jets you'll see a little engine coming out here. If you can get in that area where the engine's at, the exhaust, right, you know you're close to the engine, that's where you want to concentrate your fire. If you take out the tail rotor, if, if people don't know much about a helicopter, when you're flying a helicopter, that tail rotor stops it from spinning with the propeller. So however fast the propeller is going this way, the tail rotor is creating flow so the plane doesn't fly. So it's spinning this way. The faster this goes, the more it goes that way. If I want to turn this way, I release it and the propeller will let me turn. If I want to turn this way, I increase this and it spins me around this way. So when you lose this tail rotor on a helicopter, you're doing a lot of good damage. Uh, and that was the main thing I wanted to get out because it's hard to explain without seeing it. So let's uh, see what else I was going to talk about this thing. Uh, let's see, I went through the purpose. Uh, a great advantage, uh, yeah, control the air. Obviously, anytime you control the air, you control a lot of things. That's why the first thing we do as a military force, when our military places go in there, we shut down the air. How do we shut down the air? We drop rangers on the airports, and the, air, the rangers take over the airports. Now, once we take over the airport, we can use their landing strips. We have their air tower. We have their control tower. We have comms set up. It's easy for us to run our air ops if we take over the airport. So if you notice any time, and I don't know if they promote this all the time on the news or stuff, but anybody in the military knows, Anytime we're going in a hot, hostile area, the first thing we do is take over the airport. So once you take over the airport, you control the air. Why do you want the air? Because the air is going to give you that intel. It's going to give you the ability to move freely. I can move troops. I can cover vast areas. I can check something out. Now with drones, it means even more critical to control the air because I can launch a drone and get all that shit without having a runway or a plane. I can have a moving force. I mean, in Afghanistan, the guys have little teams that are assigned to them and they have like a little drone team and they have a little camera and etc and they're moving with the patrol unit and if they need intel the commander of that unit can say send the drone and see what's over the hill or send it down the road and see what we got coming or check that area with a drone they launch a little drone it goes over there it videotapes they look at it they view they can zoom in if they shoot the drone no big deal nobody dies we'll get another drone so drones are a huge thing and civilian owning drones with cameras is going to be a huge thing now, whether they'll work in an EMP type grid down situation is probably not. But in a government failure, you know, money failure, takeover, whatever, then your drones will probably work. And drones are going to be a critical piece. And I'm looking at a few to have one. And, you know, they're going to be able to, it transfers straight to your cell phone. It transfers, you know, they have different ways of communicating. Some will go three miles, some will go so many feet. So, if you look in the drones, you can kind of figure out how they communicate, but the video footage is great. Uh, one of my viewers, Eric, uh, bought one. He just sold it for a stinking boat, but he had a drone, and the video footage was cool. Take it up and view him. You can set it to where it follows you, which is great for a mission. If you want to record your mission on how it's going and the mistakes for later review, you want to do it for training. You're out there training with a bunch of guys, and you want to see how you look from the air, see if you're covered. You launch a drone, you tell it to lock on these guys, and you tell these guys to move problem with the drones is they're only going to get 20 25 minutes flight time so whatever your movement operation you're only going to have 25 minutes but if you get footage and it follows hi Moki, and it follows your group you're going to be able to tell are they using good command control are their intervals good etc what are you doing boy i got Moki. i got that little Moki. <laughs> Moki, hands up don't shoot <laughs> So anyway, uh, air support, it, it's something to think about, it's something to avoid and the advantages of it. No fly zones, again, we take over an air, we always make everything a no fly zone. Why? Because we know anything in the air that ain't ours is the enemy and we can shoot at it and take it down. 
Now again, military and government is going to have much greater assets to take down anything. So us using, let's just say theoretically we're fighting a government and the government goes rogue and it's taken over by the coup, the military changes, our politicians freaking just freak out for some reason, whatever. Whatever the reason is, they're going to have the military and all their assets, which means they're going to have surface-to-ground air missiles, they're going to have air-to-air -air missiles, they're going to have air-to-ground missiles. We're going to be screwed. We're actually going to be outnumbered. But what they're not going to have is they're not going to know where we are, how we move, how we fight them, hit and run. You know, every enemy has their pros and cons, and every attacking or uh, controlling force has their pros and cons. Let's see. Uh... Smoke, burning buildings. This is a great thing to defeat air support. You can burn buildings, trees, cars, oil, a 50-gallon drum. Uh, if you are in an area and you have an area of operation, you have a lot of people and you're planning a mission and you want to plan, what happens if one of these freaking pink-painted liberals that snuck into our group runs and tells the government what we're doing? You can have a plan to say, if they send air support, here's our plan. may not work, but here's our plan. We're going to have 50-gallon drums on all four corners. Why on all four corners? Because if you light smoke and the wind is blowing, if I have a 50 gallon drum burning and the smoke's coming up, depending on which way the wind's blowing is where the smoke's going to go. So if I'm here and I want cover and I have one drum here and the wind changes and blows this way, I have no cover. If I have a drum here and a drum here and a drum here, I don't care which way the wind's blowing, somehow I'm going to get cover in the middle of that smoke. Also, smoke in the air, dense black smoke, makes flight very dangerous. You don't want to do it. Again, Black Hawk Down, you saw them piling car tires in roadways. They were doubling their efforts. Smart little Muslims over there, Somali or uh, Mogadishu. So, what they were doing, when you burn tires in a roadway, you do two things. One, you light a fire and you shut down that roadway. Now they can't travel. Two, you've got black smoke filling the city and covering the top area, so you take away the ability of any Air Force drone helicopter to come in and see what they're flying into. You can hear them coming. They can't see where you're at. So you get double for your money by using tires in the middle of the road because you're blocking approaches, approach access. You're blo blocking escape routes. If you get them in the town and they come in, and you block all the roads with burning tires, now they have no way out. Um, almost kind of what they did in Black Hawk Down. It's just our guys, they took down a couple choppers and, and was too unsafe to go in. They didn't plan to go in. They didn't plan that force massing so quickly. And they had to go get the UN for heavy artillery to come in to, to rescue our guys, which is why they had to stay overnight. Staying overnight in a hostile area is not a good plan. It can, it can work, and you can modify and make it work, but it's not a good plan. Uh, so that's a good defeating tactic for defeating air support. Target your concentrated fire. I talked about that. Lasers. Uh, everybody should have a couple lasers in their house. I got green, red, whatever. Uh, you know, it's against the law to fire a sound of laser at a plane. Why? Because when a laser goes through, if you hit the pilot in the eye or it causes a flash, it can disorient them and make them not ability to fly the plane like they should. Well. That's a bad thing if you do it in peacetime to a good guy. That's a good thing if you do it in a combat time against your enemy. So if everybody has lasers, and I saw this, there was some footage on YouTube, somebody may find the link, uh, they were rioting and protesting and they had a chopper, and I think it was either Russia or the Czech or Turkey somewhere, and the helicopters were over top of the rioters and all these freaking rioters turned on green lasers and they lit that chopper up. And the chopper kind of moved a little bit. It was trying to dodge the lasers, but there were so many coming at different directions that they, they, were, they took away their effectiveness. I don't remember what they did or how long the video was or if it affected them, but great technique to affect uh, aircraft. You shine a laser at Again, you do that now, you're committing a felony. There's law and order. When law and order fails in a crisis, shit the fan, natural disaster, no 911, no police, remember, who are you going to call when the government says, we ain't coming? Who's your next call? Most people's next call is nobody. Because nobody has a plan anymore. Everybody just depends on the government. They're always going to be there. But when the government breaks down, has other priority measures, I guarantee you, 
If you're at a mall, <clears throat> lose my voice, the third video I've done. If you're at a mall and there's a shooting, and that mall is not too far from the White House, and at the White House there are guys trying to penetrate the fence, how much government assistance do you think you're going to get at that mall? Let me give you a clue. Zero, you big dummy. They're not coming to help you because they prioritize. And where do you think you fall on a priority list? I give you another clue. At the bottom. You're always at the bottom. Government, politics, uh, resources, nuclear plants, electrical grid, all these things are above you and you're at the bottom. People don't want to believe that because I'm just some tinfoil, crazy, conspiracy, right-wing, freedom, constitutional guy that don't know shit. But I'm telling you, the government puts you at the bottom and you're the first one they sacrifice if they have another higher priority target. What are you doing, Mookie? What are you doing? All right, so, uh, hell, lasers, uh, lighting from building, flashlights, same way as that. You get bright lights, everybody shines a bright light at a helicopter trying to do a mission. You're going to blind them. You're going to blind people coming out of the aircraft if they're dropping personnel. You're going to blind them so they can't see and aim their target correctly if they're trying to get a target. So lasers, lighting, smoke, combination of all uh, crashing drones into an aircraft. If you have a drone and the grid's down, maybe your drone will fly, but your camera doesn't work. But if your drone flies or you have an airplane or you have, you've modified something to fly, you fly that into an aircraft, you're going to probably affect it. Fly it in the engine, you may take out that engine. Fly it in a tail rotor on a helicopter, you may take out that helicopter. So flying something into another aircraft is another way to take down or stop an aircraft. And again, these are guerrilla tactics that, if you research it, they're everywhere. I mean, people use different things. Obviously, you throw a grenade. If you can hit it with a grenade, it'll go off. You can hit it with a law rocket. Uh, paintballs. Paintballs and windshields on choppers are pretty good. If you got a chopper that's hovering over or a drone and you got paintballs, they're not as loud as a regular gun. When that paintball hits, not only does it hurt, sting, and do damage to especially smaller craft, but it busts and it sends out plant paint. And if you get 10 dudes with paint guns shooting at one windshield on a helicopter that's hovering, you're going to take out that guy's ability to see pretty quick. Now, remember, when you shoot at a helicopter, there's a front windshield and then there's a bottom windshield where your feet's at so you can see because when you're landing you can't see in front of you so they usually have a glass shield here in front that you can see. Probably the newer more expensive choppers have video cameras and if you see a video camera that would be a good target for paintballs. Uh, drones, you could take down a drone with paintballs. Uh, let's see here. Your goal is to make it too dangerous to fly and you do that by having all these techniques against the enemy. If you make it too dangerous to fly, if you take down an aircraft or you take out pilots, they will usually abandon the air support and say it's costing us to do it. Remember, government is always about cost analysis. What are we giving up for what we gain? Sometimes you're willing to give up everything to gain this one battle. And, and, but most of the time, government is like, we don't want to lose too much. We have to know when to cut our losses. And if they're sitting in air support and you take down one, two, three aircraft, they're going to stop using air support. However, they're going to make a concentrated effort to take you out because you've become a what I call a high-value target now, and we need to take you out because you're taking out our big resources. Again, hit and move. You've got to be able to do this, be on the move, relocate, keep your interval, make it harder for them to use aircraft against you. An aircraft flying over people together will take out a lot more people than if he's flying over aircraft and everybody is scattered in a straight line. He's going to have to return and go down a straight line, and then he'll take out a lot of people. But remember, an aircraft is going in a straight line, so if you can make him take a different approach, then once you get him in a different approach, maybe that's where your smoke paintballers are at, your, hel your drones, your other aircraft, whatever. Uh, guys with shotguns, whatever. Nets, wires, uh, anti-air gun rockets, uh, if you can get a wire on a helicopter, a big wire, if you know they're flying through, I, mean, I can't tell you the number of little Cessnas that crashed out of Travis Air Force Base when I was stationed there. And they have these big power lines. If you're going to Main Gate, you'll see these big orange and red balls on these power lines. Because every time a freaking plane comes in and land, he can't see the power line, and they end up clicking it with their gear or their power line, they end up crashing. So there, somebody got a clue and said, a lot of these planes are crashing on this line. I wonder why. Maybe they can't see it. Maybe if we put big, round, red, yellow balls every five feet on these wires, 
on their approach path, the planes will see it and miss the wire. Brilliant. It's called common sense. That shit's unauthorized in liberal land. Um, let's see. Takeover airports I've already covered. Uh, have spotters on the ground calling. Uh, again, uh, Black Hawk Down, they had a lot of spotters using cell, phone down, cell phones for early warning. They had them strategically placed around the city. And you can tell when your enemy is massing a force. Again, man, it's getting warm and humid out here. It was raining and cool a few minutes ago when I started. Now it's getting freaking smoking hot. Uh, you can tell when your enemy is massing a force against you. And that's called early warning. And you want to be able to tell that. And in and, and Mogadishu, they had the little kids out with cell phones. Has an early warning or lighting fires. And when you light this fire, you, you know you're warning that there's a lot of things approaching. It's some sort of warning. You don't know if it's on ground or air, but now you have people focusing, you have people looking, now they see a bunch of planes coming in. So, again, if I know an enemy camp, and I know an enemy base of operation, and I know Homeland Security works out of here, and every time they do raids on guns, they leave from this area, this is where they meet and brief. When I was a cop and we did our meet and briefs, we always met either real close, if we had people come from different areas, we picked a parking lot, if you drive by a parking lot and there's eight or ten cops there standing around our cars, you may think they're just goofing off, but they're actually meeting there because they're about to raid a place somewhere around there. And they're handing out and they're having people meet because it was closer to meet here than it was to everybody have to go to the PD and meet, do the briefing and then everybody drive here because you had some people coming from over here. So they'll have the briefing where it's best for most of the cops. Well, anybody does that, and if you see cops gathering, you see military gathering, you see H&S, if you see them seizing weapons and somebody follows them back to see where they go for a debrief, because government always debriefs after information, after we do an op, we go back, book evidence, transport the prisoners, get everybody together, make sure we have our equipment, make sure everybody's back and safe, and then we're going to say what went wrong, what went good, what do we need to change, uh, anybody notice anything that somebody missed. So we have a debriefing. Where are they debriefing? Normally they debrief in the same place they brief. Once you learn that location, you put somebody there talking, I mean, in Vallejo, we had guys standing on a street corner when they had a drug house down here. And when we're undercover and we're driving down trying to get in there, as soon as we get there, there's little kids on the bikes on a little walkie-talkie going, blah, 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 the cops are coming. And then he rides off on his bike. And now they already know we're coming. So they're locking doors, flushing dope. By the time we get all the way down the driveway to arrest them, shit, a lot of our shit's gone. But they were smart. Uh, you, know, you can call it ghetto tactics. You can call it welfare or war warfare tactics. Whatever it is, people learn and adjust how to defeat their enemy. And if you're a drug dealer, the enemy is the cops. So uh, early warning systems should be one of your considerations when dealing with aircraft. Uh, massive balloon re release. Uh, if you, they say, if you have a bunch of balloons with metal aluminum foil strips and you let off hundreds of those or a hundred of those or whatever, that will mess up all communications. It will reflect and bounce off and cause radar to bounce off and reflect. Does it work? I don't know. Is it worth a try if you want to screw up the enemy and they're coming? Sure. If you have a bunch of balloons, everybody's got a balloon with a metal strip and they all release it at the same time and they go up in the air and all this reflective crap is up there and it may mess up the signals. Perfect. If you let a bunch of balloons loose around a helicopter or a plane flying by, maybe they'll hit it. Maybe you want to get sucked in the engine. Maybe it'll do damage. Maybe it won't. So anything that you can do or get in the air to interfere with the air uh, force that's coming against you is good. Uh, let's see. Uh, be where they don't want to bomb. Uh, this is where you know people are going to be like, "Oh man, those freaking ISIS people in Iraq! They're they're using they're shooting mortars from in front of a school, so we won't shoot back." Perfect. I got no problem with that. I think it's Weasley because they're the enemy. But if I was the enemy and I was fighting you, I don't have a problem being in front of a school. If I know you're not going to shoot back at me in front of a school, somebody else ask cowardly, you shouldn't risk the children. You, hey, man, war is hell. You know what? You do what you do to win. I don't get in a war to die saying I played fair. I get in a war to win. So I don't have a problem with these guys standing in front of a school shooting missiles. And I know I'm probably getting a lot of hate for this, but you know what? It's war. These people are fighting for their country, what they believe in. They may be dead wrong, and it may stop us from killing them, and it may piss us off, but they're effective. And one of the best things you can be in a conflict is effective. And how do you stop interfere or stop your enemy? You do what's effective. So um, I'll wait for the hate mail on that one, saying that, you know, it's for the kids, poor kids. Uh, and then you can also uh, fly false 
false, false, uh, false flags uh, make your area look like they don't want bombing. So if they're doing that reconnaissance and you know they're just filming, you may want to make it look like a friendly area. Like if I wanted to look like a friendly liberal, I'd put up a rainbow flag, I'd have pink balloons hanging, I'd have the street painted in a rainbow color, I'd have people running around with pink panties and shorts everywhere in the streets dancing, and the liberals would fly over if they were looking for a friendly area and go, oh, that's a friendly area, they're with us. And they wouldn't bomb me. So in a combat situation, if you can fly the enemy's flag, if you can make it look like you're pro-enemy, they're less likely to bomb that area. And again, you know, some people will call that, you can't do that in warfare, you can't wear the enemy's uniform. We've always worn the enemy uniform. They've always worn our uniform. But Rick, that's against the rules. I don't care the rules go out the window when you're in war. You want to live or you want to complete your mission or you want to, you know, progress and not, not lose. <coughs> All right, so that's... Uh, Dealing with air support, covered a lot of things in a lot of different areas. I'm hoarse now. This is my third video, and uh, we'll end that there. Smokey, what are you doing over there eating that chicken food? You leave that corn alone, boy. You're going to be in big trouble. Smokey, I'm talking to you. He's like, whatever, dude. <laughs>